Welcome to season four of Public Health On Call, a podcast from the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. I'm Josh Sharfstein, Vice Dean for Public Health Practice and Community Engagement and a former Commissioner of Health in Baltimore City. Our goal is to bring scientific evidence and experience to current topics in public health through engaging interviews with scientists, community leaders, policy experts, public health officials, clinicians, and more. If you have ideas or questions for us to cover, please email us at publichealthquestion at jhu.edu. That's publichealthquestion at jhu.edu for future podcast episodes. Today, our topic is the ongoing HIV epidemic among women, particularly Black women in the American South. My guest is Dr. Tiara Willey, a faculty member at the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health, whose work focuses on a specific challenge, HIV prevention among women in abusive relationships. Let's listen. Dr. Tiara Willey, thank you so much for coming to the podcast to talk about the HIV epidemic and women. Tell me the story about the challenge of HIV in women in the United States 2021. Yes, thank you for this opportunity. So for the past four decades, Black women in particular have been disproportionately affected by HIV. So what do we mean when we say that is that Black women actually represent the majority of HIV infections among women. And infections among women are not a rounding error. They're a pretty significant number of infections in the United States. Yes, yes, they are. About one in every five individuals are women who are infected. And is there a geographic area where we're seeing infections among women and particularly Black women? Absolutely. So we see that there are kind of like geographic hot spots of HIV infection, in particular in the Deep South. What are the most common ways for women to become infected with HIV? So surprisingly, over 80% of HIV infections among women are due to heterosexual sex. So... We have a lot of infections, particularly in the Deep South, particularly among Black women, resulting from heterosexual sex. Absolutely. That's it. So what makes this a difficult problem to tackle? How much time do we have? So given my area of research is really looking at the impact of gender-based violence, I would share that um, in particular, intimate partner violence is a, an important constraint on women's ability to negotiate safe sex practices and even access HIV prevention. Tell me more about what you mean. Yeah, happy to. So we, we know that women who are in abusive relationships with partners will actually fear retaliation from their partner if they talk about safe sex, like using a condom. Um, we also know that partners who use violence against women also are more likely to have untreated HIV, which means that they really can transmit the virus to their female partners. And we also know that partners will sometimes use like sabotaging tactics to prevent women from accessing the healthcare services that they need. So the usual model is, you know, you educate someone and they can protect themselves. But what I hear you saying is that's not so simple in this case. It is not simple at all. So what are the strategies that women can use to protect themselves? And how does this relate to the strategies that they can use to protect themselves from intimate partner violence? Yeah, no, perfect question. So condom, male condom use has been the primary form of like HIV prevention, but given that there's limited opportunities to negotiate, we know that that's not a good option. Pre-exposure prophylaxis though, PrEP, this kind of new biomedical way of preventing HIV transmission could be a potential game changer for women who are experiencing abuse because they don't have to talk about it with their partner. They can just use that at any time of the day, independent of when they have sex, unlike a condom, and still be prevented from HIV. Now, we have the issue about access to PrEP and talking to doctors about it for this group that really becomes another important barrier. So PrEP is a medication that women can take and be protected no matter when sex happens. Absolutely. But what's the access picture like for these women who are, you know, in abusive relationships and maybe not able to get out of them? So a lot of it comes down to whether the clinic, where they're going to seek services from, is using trauma-informed policies. So to give an example of that, 
some clinics, when they use a trauma-informed policy, will actually separate the female partner from her male partner, require the male partner be in the lobby. So she can have a private conversation with her physician and the medical assistant about what is going on. But if you don't have that policy in place, it's more likely that she won't report partner violence. She won't report the condom negotiation being an issue. And so it's really a missed opportunity to be able to offer her that access to PrEP. And, and so that, that could be in an emergency department. It could be in a, just a regular primary care clinic. But the first step is creating the environment to be able to have that conversation. Exactly. Exactly. And then you still got to be able to provide some resources. So what are the kind of resources? Let's say a clinic does that first step. You know, the partner is out in the waiting room. You have a compassionate, you know, caring clinician who is asking questions the right way. And, and sure enough, you have this conversation. Somebody is, is at risk for HIV, is worried about intimate partner violence. What's the set of services you or discussions that you hope would happen next? Yeah, that's perfect. So one of the discussions about sexual safety planning, so really helping her come up with strategies to help her stay safe while she uses PrEP. So that can be something as simple as, you know, what times of the day does your partner leave? Maybe that's the best time to take PrEP or what's an area of the home that he doesn't go to? Maybe that's where she can store her PrEP at too. And so the sad thing is that if we're not having these conversations about these strategies, it can automatically kind of like shut down the conversation for her while she's trying to decide the pros and cons to using PrEP in her relationship. I would also hope that there will be conversations with like community resources outside of the healthcare clinic. So like domestic violence agencies, if that's something that she's interested in, just so she can continue to have that support in between her medical visits. This is recognizing that Some people really can't or at the moment aren't interested in leaving their relationships, but nonetheless want to stay safer. Exactly. Exactly. So I know that you're doing some work to help clinics provide this kind of care. Can you tell me about that? Yeah, happy to. So right now we're rolling out a four week or a month long training with community healthcare clinics in Mississippi, really teaching them about intimate partner violence, how it's impactful for Black Black women in the HIV epidemic, and really talking about strategies of like creating a domestic violence screening tool and protocol in these settings, and how to have conversations that really normalize safe sex practices and reduces medical mistrust amongst this population. It's a booyah base of a lot of things. Yeah. So you're going into the clinics, telling them you're not really maybe not telling them, but helping them with the realization (laughs) yes, that they're not really doing everything they can to help if they're not able to have these kinds of safe conversations with with women. Exactly, exactly. And we're also working with the local domestic violence agency to create those collaborations between the healthcare clinic and the DV agency as well. So I was going to ask you about that because it seems like one side of the coin is making sure that there's more discussion about uh, intimate partner violence and the risk of HIV infection in regular healthcare settings. But what about discussion of HIV and these kinds of risks in uh, intimate partner domestic violence settings? So somebody shows up at a shelter, that's not a clinic necessarily, but they may, you know, be at risk for HIV. What do you want to see happen there? Yes, that's perfect. So we definitely want there to be conversations around HIV risk and HIV prevention in the domestic violence agencies, whether that's a shelter or a hotline or support group. And part of that is because these agencies are really the ones building the trust and rapport with this population. And so we know that women who are seeking domestic violence services really feel comfortable talking to advocates about what's going on in their relationship, including HIV and and sexual safety. So do you want these clinics, for example, to have doctors on speed dial who can prescribe these PrEP medicines that keep women safe from HIV? I mean, that would be the dream. I would love to have a, 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 like a medical staff on site at the DV agency is the, is the big ideal, but you know, we still got a couple of years to figure that out. (laughs) 
<laughs> Got it. So for now, you're you're talking about making connections between the clinics and the agencies, exactly, and and then seeing what what happens, exactly. You know, it it's pretty incredible that we're so many years into the HIV epidemic, and so many women have gotten sick, and this kind of work is really just beginning. Just beginning, but there's a lot of opportunity for it too. Just got to have the right collaborations. What? What's the reward for clinics that do this kind of work? Ooh. I mean, they're making the world a better place. Let me think of the <laughs> reward. I mean, I think the, so there, I see it as two phases. So we know that intimate partner violence screening in these clinics can actually reduce partner violence over time because women are more likely to be connected to some type of intervention, whether that's a DV agency or leaving their relationship when they're ready. So really, we're looking at the reduction of partner violence for these women, which is fantastic. And what's also nice is because we're having these conversations integrated with sexual health and HIV prevention, ideally, we will also see a reduction in the HIV epidemic in these particular hot spots where HIV is high. So there's a lot at stake uh, for really making sure that these programs can provide the services that women in these difficult circumstances really need. Absolutely. High stakes, high reward. Dr. Willie, thank you so much for coming onto the podcast and opening what I think will be a lot of listeners' eyes to, to this challenge and the kinds of solutions you're talking about. Perfect. Thank you for the opportunity. This was great. Public Health On Call is produced by Josh Sharfstein, Lindsay Smith-Rogers, and Stephanie Desmond. Audio production by Spencer Greer, Niall Owen McCusker, CN Oates, and Matthew Martin with support from Chip Hickey. Distribution by Nick Moran. Production support from Catherine Ricardo and Neiman Outlin. Social media support from Brenda Hagater, Grace Holes Fernandez, and Caroline Wong. Thank you for listening. Thank you.